started on this. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Converse with Clover. I am your host, Clover Perez. We have an amazing guest with us today. He has such an incredible, incredible story. He's a person who is on extreme purpose, I would say. And um, once you listen to his story, I know that when I read it, I was in tears. And I know that this is going to make a lasting impact on the audience. There are so many people out there that needs to know that this is happening in the United States, right? Where we live at. And I always believe that we need to be more aware of what's going on in our surrounding, in our communities. So let's welcome attorney Jeffrey Dus Duskovich. I hope I pronounced your name um, correctly. I don't want to, um, you know, mess your name up. Welcome to Converse with Clover. I'm going to give you this opportunity to just give us a, a, a background of your story and to introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks for having me on, Clover. Um, so I guess the... Uh... The, sh the short of it, and you'll develop it as you will as the host uh, through your questions, is I, I spent 16 years in prison in New York for a murder and rape, which I didn't commit. I got arrested when I was 16, and uh, ultimately I was wrongfully convicted despite the DNA not matching me the, with the conviction being caused by a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, terrible public defender. I uh, was given a 15 to life sentence. Um, I lost seven appeals. I got turned down for parole. Ultimately, I was exonerated through further DNA testing, which not only reaffirmed my innocence, but also identified the actual perpetrator. So my charges were dismissed on actual innocence grounds, and he was subsequently arrested and convicted. So I have a nonprofit organization, Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, which has as its mission to free people in the same position I was once in. So we've gotten 14 people home. We um, passed laws aimed at preventing what happened to me from happening to others. We've helped to pass six laws and I became an attorney. That is awesome. That is awesome. Such an incredible, incredible story. As I was saying to you earlier, you know, when I read your story, um, I just started crying because as a formerly incarcerated um, person, but also a mother of two boys, I cannot even imagine you know, how your parents must have felt with you going to prison at such a young age. So let's walk us through what happened, what really happened, and why you was charged. Sure. So the year is 1990. Uh, I'm 16 years old. It's in Westchester County, New York, uh, specifically in the city of Peekskill. It's a suburbs. It was um, ethnically diverse. It was a middle class city. So this murder happened. Um, the victim was a 15-year-old immigrant from Colombia. She had been in the country for about a year and a half. She was leading a very sheltered life, as I came to learn later on, where she never went anywhere unless she was accompanied by her older sister or her parents. And she went missing. Uh, and uh, her body was found a couple of days later. It was found naked from the waist down. And, you know, it, the city of Peekskill uh, essentially came to a halt. I mean, parents were concerned with their own safety, the safety of their children. They were dropping their kids off to school, picking them up right, right after that. There were town hall meetings that were held, you know, updates on investigation, safety tips. So in high school, I was quiet. I said myself, I didn't participate in a lot of organized sports. And that made me seem strange to the kids in the high school. So in the course of the police investigation, they interviewed a lot of students from the high school. And some of them told the police that they might want to speak with me. That's how I got on the police radar. I was a sensitive teenager. This was my first brush with death, and I had an emotional reaction. And the police thought that, you know, given that I barely knew the victim, you know, which was that she was in two of my classes as a freshman, one as a sophomore. I knew her name. She knew mine. That was really the extent of it. We weren't even really on a high by basis. They thought that my being emotional uh, was some sort of outward indication that I was sorry for what I did. Yeah. Although in a large, although in a larger sense, I really wasn't all that different from other people in peak skill. I mean, it affected everybody emotionally to the point that free mental health services were offered to anybody who wanted it. Now, the peak skill police got a psychological profile from the NYPD, which purported to have the psychological characteristics of the actual perpetrator. And I had the misfortune of uh, matching that. Um, so for the next six weeks, the, cat, the police played this cat and mouse game with me in which half the time they would 
speak to me as if I was the suspect and the other half the time they would pretend like they would need my help to solve the crime. You know, before I was a teenager, I dreamed about being a police officer when I grew up. So somehow or another, the police learned that. And again, when they would push too hard and I would get frightened and I'd want to get away from them, Jeff is this junior detective helper theme was developed. So they would say things like, well, the kids won't talk freely around us, but they will around you. Let us know if you hear anything. Uh, stop in from time to time. They would ask me opinion questions and congratulate me that my opinion was correct. Right, right. The, I came from a single parent household. My father was never involved in my life in any aspect. And that intersected with the good cop, bad cop technique where one officer was pretending to be my friend. So in time, I began to look to the officer who was pretending to be my friend as a father figure. So eventually, they got me to agree to take a polygraph test. They said, look, we have some new information in the police file. We want to share that with you. That's going to allow you to be more helpful to us. But first, we want you to take and pass the polygraph. So the next day, rather than report to uh, the high school, I went to the police station for the test. And because it was a school day, my mother and grandmother thought that I was in school. So they had no idea that anything was wrong. And therefore, they did not call around looking for me. But they drove me to the town of Brewster, which was in Putnam County. So it was 40 minutes away by car. So that meant I wasn't able to leave anymore. I was totally dependent upon the police. There were three officers that came there with me from Peekskill. Then there was the polygraphist, who was a Putnam County, Putnam County Sheriff's investigator, but he was dressed like a civilian. He never identified himself as law enforcement. He never read me my rights. They, I didn't have an attorney present. They didn't give me anything to eat the entire time I was there. They gave me a four-page brochure, which explained how the polygraph worked, but then it had a lot of big words in it that I didn't understand. But then I figured, well, well was young, I was right? young. He was Correct. young. Yeah. Well, stop mm -hmm. right there. I just want to, um, because I don't want to lose this. So your your mother did not know that you went to the precinct to take this polygraph test? Correct. Wow. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So after, you know, after finishing this brochure, which, as I said, I didn't really understand, but I figured, well, I'm there to help the police anyway. So what does it matter? Let's just get on with it. So from there, they put me in a small room and they gave me countless cups of coffee, which got me nervous. And then they hooked me up to the machine. And then he launched into his third degree tactics. So he raised his voice at me. He invaded my personal space. He kept asking me the same questions over and over again. And as each hour passes by, my fear increases in proportion to the time. Towards the end, he said, you know, what do you mean you didn't do it? We just, you just told us through the test that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. And that really shot my fear to the roof. And then the officer was pretending to be my friend. He came in the room and he told me that the other officers were going to harm me, that he had been holding them off, but couldn't do so indefinitely, that I had to help myself. Then he said, just tell them what they want to hear. You can go home afterwards. You're not going to be arrested. So bringing young, naive, frightened, 16 years old, I wasn't thinking about the long term. I was just concerned with my safety in the moment. I was in fear of my life. The fact that I didn't know where I was and that nobody else knew where I was either loomed kind of large in my mind. And then there was this uh, push-pull dynamic, you know, the possibility of harm, this false life preserver. So I took the out which he offered, and I made up a story based on the information they gave me that day in a six-week run up to it. By the time it was all said and done, I had collapsed on the floor in a fetal position, crying uncontrollably. Uh, obviously, I was arrested, and I was charged with a murder and rape. The last thing I'll add is that the interrogation was not videotaped. It was not audio taped. There was no signed confession. It was just the officer's word for it. And when they came to court, they left the threat and false promise out of their testimony. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So they brought you down to the prison without any guardian, right? And then right. no attorney. And then they, you know, force you into making this false confession. Of course, you are a child, right? Your parents doesn't know where you're at. You're at a court. 
you're the precinct and now the police is, you know, doing this um in this fear tactic on you. And then all of a sudden you said, okay, you know what? I did this because ultimately what you want now is to go home, right? Didn't right. even know that this is this was going to happen to you. My God, this is something that, you know, I cannot even believe that it's happening here. I'm I'm when I tell you I'm speechless, I'm not surprised because from a person who has been involved in a criminal legal system, I know what the prosecutors can do. I know what the cops can do, but I never thought that it's possible to do this to a child. After you confess and they arrest you, um, what happened after that? Before I went to the, the trial, the results of a DNA test came in from the FBI lab, which showed that seminal fluid found in and around the victim didn't match me. But instead of acknowledging they made a mistake, they kept prosecuting uh, full speed ahead. The prosecutor got the medical examiner to commit fraud, to commit perjury. When there is an autopsy done, they take written and audio notes as they're making their findings. So it was only six months after doing the autopsy, only after the DNA didn't match me, that the medical examiner suddenly said he remembered that he forgot to document medical findings, which he claimed showed that the victim was promiscuous. And that's what opened the door for the prosecutor to argue that that was how the DNA didn't match me. And yet I was guilty that she was sleeping around and that she in fact had slept with somebody else prior to my murdering and, and raping her. And then he took it a step further and said, and mentioned another youth by name that he claimed had slept with the victim. But he never got a DNA sample from him to prove that. He didn't even call him as a witness. He just made the unsupported argument to the jury. He, I'm, he got, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just totally flabbergasted by all of this. So what did your attorney do? What? My attorney essentially allowed him to get away with it. So firstly, my attorney basically didn't defend me. He never interviewed or called as a witness my alibi. I was actually playing wiffle ball when the crime happened. He never explained to the jury the significance of the DNA not matching me. He never used that to argue that it proved the confession was coerced and false. He stood up in open court and told the medical examiner, you're going to be pleased to know that I don't have a single question for you. My lawyer should have never represented me in the first place because of a conflict of interest. So this other youth that the prosecutor was falsely saying had slept with the victim was represented by another member of the Westchester County Legal Aid and specifically by the lawyer who was supposed to be supervising him on my case. So that conflict prevented the defense from asking him to give a DNA sample. It prevented the defense from calling him as a witness. Uh, he rarely met with me whenever I tried to explain to him what happened in the interrogation room and that I was innocent. He was always shutting me up. One time he told me he didn't he didn't care if I was guilty or innocent. You know, and the other thing I want to point out is that the victim's family was not coming to court. So they had no idea, you know, the terrible things that were they were saying about her in the court in the furtherance of trying to convict me. But there was a there were a couple of other uh well I want to mention another thing about my attorney. There's a couple of things about the trial I'd like to I'd like to cover. Yes, go ahead. So, firstly, when you defend a case where there's a confession, you, you have to answer that confession. You have to explain the confession, you have to disprove it, bring it all together in your closing argument. I mean, otherwise anybody would face a substantial risk that the jury is gonna found you guilty if they hear that there's a confession. But my lawyer didn't do any of that. Sometimes he argued to the jury that confession never happened at all. Other times he told them it did happen, but it was coerced. And still other times he was saying that it was a false confession. Uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't allow me to testify. You know, he said it wasn't his job to prove that I was innocent. It was up to the prosecutor to prove I was guilty. But that, that's a very naive way of practicing right, law. Right, right, right. 
Uh, polygraph results are not admissible in court because the polygraph is not scientific and sometimes it's failed by frightened innocent people. So the only way it would be allowed in would be if both sides agreed. So the defense did not agree to let the polygraph come in, but the judge created a backdoor rule. He said, well, this alleged confession happened while you were hooked up to the polygraph. So I'm going to allow the polygraphist to testify. And the polygraphist repeatedly told the jury that I failed when I lied, denying when I he repeatedly told the jury that I lied when I denied committing the crime. But he banned my lawyer from asking him questions about the methods that he used to arrive at his opinion. Then the the bra, the victim's bra and her clothes had been entered into evidence by the prosecution and the jury asked to see the bra which was important because one of the statements they coerced out of me is that, as I said, look, I ripped her bra off, but there's some bras, the way they're made, you, you can't rip them off. So the jury has to see the bra. And that's when the judge said, well, the, the bra had been left in the court over the weekend and the janitors thought it was garbage. So it's been thrown out. So it's not available anymore. He substituted a picture in which he said, you could almost see the bra he substituted that picture for the actual bra. So you have uh, the police officers, you have the prosecutor, you have the um, your attorney, Med and you and the medical the examiner, and the medical and all working in concert together to convict you, a child. You are a sixteen years old. You're still a child, right? A teenager, and they would actually sit there and be okay with placing all of these fictitious charges on you, knowing deep down inside that you did not commit this crime. I I'm just not understanding how, did you have a problem with the police officers? Was there, was this some form of a retaliation? I'm not understanding. No, there, no, I, no, I, it was not a retaliation. I mean, I never had any hostility with the police. I'd certainly never been arrested for any, any, anything. I think, I think it was just, a, it was a lot of public pressure to, you know, solve the crime, to make an arrest and ultimately to convict somebody. You know, I, I want to mention that on the third day of the jury deliberation, they sent out a note asking, well, if we can't come up with a verdict, are we going to be kept sequestered uh, over the Christmas holiday? And the judge said, yes. And I learned many years later that at that point, the, it was 11 to 1 for a conviction, but there was a holdout juror. Um, but they were pressing the holdout and juror. And then when the note, the answer to that note came back, that, that ratcheted up the pressure and nobody wanted to be there over the Christmas holiday. So, and he didn't either. So he, he switched his vote. And I, I was found guilty of a murder and rape. And I was given a 15 to life sentence, despite the judge telling me on the record, maybe you are innocent. And I was then sent to a men's maximum security prison as a 17 year old. Did you understand what was going on? So you were 16 years old doing a trial, right? Or well, I was 16 when I was arrested. I, I turned 17 a 17. couple of months before the okay. trial. Mm -hmm. Did you understand what was going on? You're sitting Not there and all of these, I'm sure legal terms, right? And um, they're accusing you of a crime that you did not commit, and they're saying all these um, salacious things about this individual, this person that was uh, murdered and raped, and now they're um, they're saying that it's you. Did you conceptualize what was going on at that time, at that moment? Did you really understand what was going on, and that it's a possibility that you may have been found guilty and go to prison? Did you understand that? Not fully, no, not fully. No, I couldn't. I was 17 years old. There was nothing in my old. background. I didn't fully understand it. And then, you know, in addition to that, which which compounded my lack of understanding, you know, limited education and my age was also that, you know, my lawyer would not allow an adult to participate in any of the conversations with him. Like he wouldn't allow my mother. You know, I had one uncle by marriage who was in law enforcement, but my lawyer would not allow them to be in the conversation to help explain things to me. So, you know, things like, well, are you going to testify? Are you not going to testify? Do we want to have a jury trial? Do we want a bench trial? You know, I, I was just me. 
And I didn't, no, I did not fully understand, understand everything. No. Okay, so now you, how long did the trial last? About two weeks. Okay. One or, one or two weeks. Mm -hmm. Right. And while the, okay, so once you was arrested, let's go back a little bit. Were you yeah. released on bail or you were still yes. arrested? You was released no, I was released on bail. I was released on bail after 35 days. Okay. And now you went to trial. Did they, and you blew trial. Did they remand you right away? Yes. How did that feel? How did that feel? It, it, it felt like I couldn't really believe what my senses were telling me. I mean, I never, I never heard of a wrongful conviction and the idea that somebody innocent might be found guilty. I mean, that, that wouldn't have dawned on me at that, you know, at that at that age. I, I I didn't know. I felt like an out of control feeling, and like I, I felt like I didn't know what was going to happen next. Oh my god! And your were, your mother was in the courtroom when you was found guilty. She what, was. What? How did she? Just how did she react? And you seen her, knowing that they remanded you at that moment. How was that? It was definitely traumatic, and 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 to put some color to it, uh, they read the first three charges off because they charged me with different theories of murder, right? So they read off the first three charges, and I was found not guilty of the first three, and so she kind of jumped the gun and you know kind of like jumped up in the courtroom with her hands up, like like you know like you might if you're at a sporting event, like somebody just hit a board, important basket or made right. a touchdown or something. And then the next thing is read off and, you know, guilty and guilty and guilty. And, you know, I mean, I, I remember thinking, well, well, wait a minute. Did, did, did I hear that right? Was that, did I, did I like not hear the word not? I mean, you know, so that's on my end, but on, 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 on her end, I mean, in conversations with her, I mean, I've, you know, I've learned, I mean, that, that, she, said that she was kind of like in a stunned disbelief. She was kind of beside herself. Right, right. I can only imagine. So they remanded you and they took you. Did you go to a juvenile um, detention? No. No, I went to the adult county jail. At 17 years old? Yes. And you stayed there for a while before they transport you to a prison? Well, I, yes, but I mean, but obviously be, between the county jail and the prison, they brought me back to court to be sentenced. And be then, sentenced, okay. And then a short, yeah, and which as I mentioned, I got the 15 to life sentence. And then a short time after that, I was transferred from okay. the county jail to the state prison. Okay, did anyone tell you that if you were found guilty, this is the charges that you will be will get in? You mean the sentence? That the that sentence, would be the sentence. Said, yes, the sentence. No, nobody so told me that. When you heard 15 years to life, how did that feel? I felt like my life was over. I couldn't I couldn't conceptualize doing 15 years. You know, I'm pausing before asking the question because it's hard for me. I'm. I wasn't. You know. This is. This is not me. This is. This is your story. And it's hard for me to even understand that this happened to you. I am hurt for you. I know it's been years, but I am hurt for you. I'm terrified, really, of all the others that will get caught up into a situation like this, and that in this country that we're living in that this is really happening. And I hear this all the time, you know, from other people, you will hear their stories, but never had a conversation with anyone that this has happened to. And so I have to pause and kind of reflect and also be mindful because I know that even though it, um, it has happened for a while, it's still a traumatic experience for you. You know, and so I have to just be mindful of that. And again, I, I just want to continue to say that I appreciate you sharing this and have to go back and relive the whole situation um, that happened. It's just it's, it's a terrible, terrible um, tragedy. And I am so sorry that you had to um, experience this.
So you were sentenced. And now what prison did you go to? Downstate Correctional Facility, which is a reception center, meaning they get, they issue you, you, you know, your, your prison uniform, the supplies, they evaluate your health, they evaluate your, your mental health, and they decide what's the first prison going to be that they send you to. Did you see other um, young men your age there as or, as well, or no? A, a few, but not not very many. Oh. I think I saw I think I saw maybe like three to four people, but everybody else were fully formed adults. OK, one of the things that I know that's looked down on is anyone that goes to prison for murder or for rape. Rape is really looked down on. What happened when you went to prison and they found out that you were in for rape? Yeah, there was different times where I was there where I was beat up. One, one time I nearly lost my life. I, I got hit on the side of my head with um, a 10 pound weight plate. So, I mean, the idea of like the concern, you know, or fear on my end, you know, was, you know, it was always something in the back of my head that people would discover what, you know, that the prisons would discover what I was right, right. incarcerated for. Cause as you correctly point out, there's a, you know, there's a, you know, um, vigilante mentality, you know, towards people convicted of sex offenses. Right, right. And how, how did you, how did you tell me, how did you make it? How? I, well, I think belief in God was one thing. And another thing was, um, you know, I, I didn't concentrate on a, you know, the 15 in life sentence. I thought I just have to somehow hold on for the next, to the next year or two where, you know, where the next appeal would be decided, which I was sure I was going to win and I was going to go home. Uh, I used to go to a law library and study the law and that gave a sense of comfort. I, I would read articles about other people who were exonerated and that gave me some motivation. Although that was somewhat of a double-edged sword because at some point, a lot of the people that were being exonerated were being exonerated based on DNA. And I knew the DNA didn't match me. So that felt frustrated. You know, I didn't feel like, you know, why should my case be different? Uh, I took programs that had some kind of potential value in the event that I regained my freedom. And, you know, I, I thought about it. I didn't think about it like I'm going to my prison assignment in the morning and my prison assignment in the afternoon. I'm going to school. I'm going I'm going to work. And um, from 1998 to 2006, I I read uh, three or four nonfiction books, you know, a, a, a week. So and uh and I, I used to play basketball and I engaged in elaborate delusion when I would play sports. Like I would play basketball or ping pong or chess. I would pretend like I was a professional player and so were the other people. But it, it really wasn't like kids fooling around on a playground. I, I needed to leave the prison for a couple of hours. And that delusion was what my mind came up with. And you know, the uh, it's not the prison guards, it's the correction officers, it's not the prison warden, it's the superintendent. And, you know, when they gave us, uh, well, when they allowed us to purchase televisions in the cell, which was uh, 97, 98, you know, for the most part, my television stayed off because I was doing legal work and reading books, but there were some weekly programs I'd watch. And I, again, the delusion, I mean, I would pretend that certain programs I was more like, you know, visiting, I was like visiting with friends. I mean, because for the most part, I really wasn't getting visits, you know, so that, again, the delusion and, you know, and uh, developing little bit of like routines, like on Sundays, I would listen to, I would listen to the, the, the football on the radio, you develop little minor routines. I had to keep fighting off feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, thoughts of giving up. I mean, sometimes I, you know, thought about suicide. I, I mean, I guess it's natural to think about that in, right. uh, in that, in that, in that setting. And, you know, um, you learn prison survival tactics. I mean, there were a few old timers there. And, you know, when you're in your cell, don't talk out your gate. Don't ask anyone for anything. Don't borrow anything. Don't get involved in conversations regarding what's going to be watched on the television. And, you know, and don't gamble. And, you know, you, these different, you know, if something happens, you put your back to the wall, keep everyone in front of you. So do you, you learn these different survival tactics and, you know, try to understand who who's around me and, you know, who were the gang members and to, to, to stay away from them. And, you know, all, all of those things. And if you do that, I mean, you can, you can minimize, not eliminate, you know, being, in, 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 you know, being involved in problems there. Right, right.
I know um, in the female prison, you know, women were very nurturing. So we would mm -hmm. be there for one another, you know, and we have, of, you know, even the old timers that's been there, we can go to them and we can talk to them. Did you have a mentor um, while you were there that was able to help you? I, I, I did, but I mean, it wasn't like one person, like in a cohort manner through longevity. It was more like I had, when I first arrived, there was someone to mentor me, just some of the prison survival tactics who suggested, look, you need to go to the law library and study the law and fight your case. And then, you know, uh, you know, someone else, I might've learned a few other tactics. And then later on, someone else said, look, why don't, why don't you stop wasting your time reading all these fiction books? Why, why don't you read nonfiction and learn, get entertained and learn something all at the same time? So it was more like some sporadic things here, here, here and there, but definitely the, 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 the mentor played a role, just split up, as I mentioned. Right. And, you know, being convicted of a crime that you committed is in going to prison is, is difficult, but going to prison for a crime that you didn't commit, my God, that must really have played on you mentally. It really did. I, I, I met a lot of people that they said, look, you know, I did what I did. I, I got caught. You know, I did something wrong and now I got to pay for that. So I'm not going to cry about it. I'm just going to make the best of it and try to go home as quickly as I can. And I could never really get to that point because I knew that, you know, I, I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't belong there. I, I didn't know how long incarceration was going to, going to last. I knew that the parole board want, wants to hear people express remorse, take responsibility. I knew I was never going to do that. I was always going to assert my innocence. So, you know, and it was a life sentence, 15 a life, meaning I had to do 15 years minimum. And the life part meant that really there was never a point in time where they were going to be legally obligated to release me would be up to the parole board. So. Right. Right. Oh my God. Did you stay in one facility or were you, or did they transport, transport you to different facilities? They transported me to, to different facilities, but that being said, I mean, I spent the bulk of my time in Elmira. So I spent 13 and a half of the 16 years in Elmira, but it wasn't 13 and a half years there straight. So from 91 and 95, I was in Elmira. They transferred me to Eastern. Then uh, I went back to Elmira after a couple of months. And then I was in uh, Elmira for uh, about 10 months. And then I went to Shawangunk for a year and a half. Then they moved me back to Elmira again. I was there for a decade. And then the last uh, 28 days, I, I was transferred to Sing Sing, where I went from Sing Sing to Westchester County Court and from the court to home. Okay. Wow. Now, let's talk about now you being exonerated. You was you did you went to the law library. You was working on your own case and you was filing all these appeals. And what happened? I was going to the law library, I was learning the law, and I was sending suggestions to lawyers. I mean, I did have legal representation, so I, I wasn't filing the things myself. They were, but I was sending ideas and, you know, reviewing drafts and giving, giving, giving some input. But eventually I reached the point where all of my appeals were exhausted, which means, you know, you, you, that means you're permanently locked out of the court. So that I lost seven appeals. Um, that took up 11 years. And at that point, the only way back in the court is as if you can, if there's if to one of two things, either there's a retroactive change in the law, or else if you can find some previously unknown evidence of innocence, that probably would have led to a different outcome. So I didn't have money to hire an attorney or an investigator. So I started a letter writing campaign. I did that for four years, uh, rarely getting responses other than the occasional no. As I, and uh, I mentioned I went to the parole board. I got denied there. Um, but one of the letters that I sent to a book author in care of the publishing company was sent not to the author, but to an investigator. And the uh, investigator um, believed in my innocence when she saw the DNA test results. She hadn't saw a case where someone was excluded by DNA and yet they were convicted. So she tried to get people to take my case and she gave me ideas and one of her ideas proved to be the winning one. She said, why don't you write the Innocence Project, a nonprofit organization in Manhattan that works to free wrongfully convicted prisoners across the country where 
DNA evidence can demonstrate innocence. So I wrote them before in 1992 and 93. There, what they were doing is they were um, just taking cases where testing was an option. And if the test results excluded their client, they would present it back to court as newly discovered evidence. But that wasn't an option for me because the evidence wasn't new. It was already it already had been in front of the jury. So the investigator said, look, the DNA data bank has been created. So the prior denial was irrelevant. Just write them again. So I did that. I looked for other ways of getting representation and, you know, nothing else worked. So there was an intake worker who was not a lawyer. And when the lawyers did not want to take the case because the DNA already excluded me, she represented the case a second time. And they didn't, when they didn't want to take it a second time, she represented it a third time. And the third time she pushed it across, they agreed to represent me. So that was the first key. Second key is the former Westchester District Attorney, um, Janine Pirro, um, who had blocked me from getting further testing a few times and who had fought seven appeals. She, she had left office and her successor was willing to let me get the testing. And the third thing is that um, they took the crime scene DNA evidence, which already didn't match me, and they put it in the data bank and it matched the actual perpetrator whose DNA was only there because left free while I was doing time for his crime, he killed a second victim uh, three and a half years later, who was a school teacher and um, had two children. So my conviction was overturned October, um, excuse me, September 20th, 2006. And then I was released and I went back to court November 2nd, 2006, at which point all the charges were dismissed against me on actual innocence grounds. And he was subsequently arrested and convicted of the crime. Bravo, bravo, bravo. You know, at first, when I listen to your story and I'm saying to myself, the officers from the start, the judge, your attorney, the prosecutor, I mean, they took your power away, but you took your power back when you went to prison because, you know, at a young age, you could have just give up. Right. You could have done, but you fought them and you won and congratulations. And my God, look at what you are doing now. Look at what you are doing down. I'm so glad that you did not allow your pain to guard you. Right. And now you are an attorney. So let's talk about that. Cause that's, that's something that we want to celebrate. We are, so, and, and your foundation, and then you're helping people who was in, similar situation um, to you. Oh my God. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about your work. But before we do that, let's talk about how you got into law school. Sure. Okay. So um, I, I tried to get into law school. So I got in a scholarship for Mercy College to finish the bachelor's because I had come within 30 credits before they cut the funding. So they gave me a scholarship. And um, when I finished the bachelor's degree, I applied to get into law school, but um, I didn't score well enough on the LSAT. So I went to grad school and got a master's degree instead. Um, my thesis was written on wrongful conviction, cause and reform. And I thought the extra credential would make me a better advocate because despite all the natural struggles of reintegrating from the psychological after effects to the stigma, to being released with nothing, to lacking stability of housing, almost being in a homeless shelter, to technology being different, cell phones, GPS, internet, to my strange, my family being strangers and it just being lonely. Despite all that struggle, I nonetheless, you know, got the bachelor's and I started doing individual advocacy work. So I was speaking, I was writing, I was a columnist for a weekly newspaper writing about wrongful conviction and general criminal justice issues. Started uh, meeting with elected officials and I was trading privacy for awareness by sharing my story. So I did that for about uh, five years. And then I finally was financially compensated. I, I took some of the money and I started the, non the nonprofit, the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, continuing what I was doing as an individual, but from the nonprofit perspective. And we, you know, we we were able, you know, we've been able so far to get 14 people home, help pass six laws. Oh, yeah. And at some point I got tired of I got tired of sitting in the front row. I wanted to sit at the defense table and represent some of the clients and make some of the arguments. 
Um, hence, I made another stab. Seven years after not getting into law school, I, I tried again. And this time I, I got into law school. Uh, I graduated law school in 2019 in pursuit of the dream of exonerating others as a lawyer. Uh, past December, um, that dream took a large step. So I, I, as co-counsel, I helped to overturn um, Andre Brown's wrongful conviction, who it did 23 years. So he came home a couple of weeks before uh, Christmas. We got home to time with his um, kids and his and his wife. And I have a full caseload now of other people I'm working to uh, working to exonerate. And, and we're doing policy work in New York. Uh, Pennsylvania, which you know is one of twelve states that does not compensate people, and uh, then California, you know, working on uh, oversight for prosecutors. So my life is this advocacy work and the the, the public education piece with the media and writing and speaking and sometimes um, instructing, whether it's judges, defense lawyers, prosecutors, uh, police cadets, believe it or not, sometimes. So have message will travel and, you know, just about raising awareness and education uh, on the issue of wrongful conviction and, and then some of the secondary um, uh, policy issues, the non-innocence justice reform the topics, things that either I was subjected to or that I witnessed from solitary confinement to uh, to ma you ma mass incarceration, to the, the, the terrible um, health care in prison and how the prison was particularly inept with respect to the advanced geriatric needs of, of older prisoners and the issue of compassionate release and how Often by the time Department of Corrections decide if, if someone's going to be granted compassionate release, which means that you know, you've been determined to be uh, terminally ill. So the idea is you could be released from prison early to be in, to be surrounded with your friends and family to die with a little bit of dignity in a normal environment that a lot of times by the time they made those decisions, I mean, someone either would have passed away or they would be uh, maybe just a day or two left rather than maybe like, a, you know, one or one or two weeks. So uh, all those issues, you know, uh, um, solitary confinement and, you know, college education for prisoners and how, you know, the curriculum and many of the vocational trades, um, you know, is, is obsolete. You know, I, I completed six certificates in plumbing and most of the training was in metal pipe or cast iron. And so if I wanted that career, I would start at virtually the same place that I would had I not taken that that program and you know the verbal abuse of the guards towards the prisoners and how there really didn't seem to be much of an effort on the part of security or the prison administration even at curtailing the, the general amount of violence that went on in the prison so all those things I you know I I, I speak about those things wow. and parole reform many people being denied parole over and over again people with college degrees and vocational trades and good disciplinary records and the only thing that seem the matter would be if you were incarcerated for a violent crime or not. I mean, it seemed to be like a complete abandonment of any idea of a belief in, you know, rehabilitation or or a or a a second a second chance. Right, right. Wow. You know, you spoke about um earlier your faith kept you grounded. Mm -hmm. When I hear your story, I said, look at God. He turned yes. your pain into purpose instead of coming home bitter you came home better and now you are helping so many that is a blessing in disguise that is a blessing how is i don't know if your your, your mom mm -hmm. is um still alive how is she, she is she's yeah my mom is still alive. my mom is still alive she, yeah. she's very proud of me she's very of proud course, of me of course yeah. of course who wouldn't be who would not be I mean, oh my God, I wish I was there to just give you a hug because mm -hmm. I am so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so sorry that, you know, you went through what you went through, but oh God, you may not, you know, we always hear the saying that we don't like the um the journey, but we love the destination of where it leads to yes. where you're at right now, you know, and, um, you know, just helping so, so many people right now. Do you think, or do you believe that your work is healing you? 100%, 100%, yes, my work is definitely healing me. Healing me. It's it's therapeutic, it's healing. You know, I can take some solace that, you know, my suffering didn't go, didn't go for nothing. 
You know, um, I'm not an angry person. I want to enjoy my life as much as I can. I can't do that if I'm angry or bitter. I, I feel like I lost so much as is. Why would I want to, in effect, lose the rest of my life? And, you know, I, I take the energy that I feel and I, I channel it into the advocacy work that I do. And, you know, that's that's my that's my release for it. And, you know, I do make sense of my life in a kaleidoscopic type of way. I, I do think that I went through everything in order to do the work that I'm doing now. And so with that, I, you know, I have some inner peace. Right. Because you can relate both sides, right? And yes. You know, sometimes we come across these attorney, they are so desensitized because, you know, and they feel so cold, but now you having had that lived experience can really understand what someone is going through when they're going through this whole criminal justice um process. So kudos to you. I am, when I tell you, I am so proud of you. I am proud of you. And I, and I hope going forward, I can call you a friend, you know, because, Absolutely. oh Absolutely. my God. Yeah. This, you, you, you know, this, you're someone I want in my corner, you know, someone want, you know, to, because I can just emulate you. You have done so much great things and I'm so happy that your mother is alive to see this, you know, to see that her son is out of prison and just the great work that he's doing. So tell me about the foundation that you have. Let, let's hear a little bit more about that. Sure. So currently we have um, 13 cases we're, we're, we're working on. I'm count, um, either the lead attorney or, or second seating another attorney in nine of them, the 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 other um, the other the other four I just periodically get updates from the lawyers that are working on those. Uh, in terms of uh, policy issues, so we have a, there's a few bills that are pending now in in the New York State Legislature which address uh, false confession. So there's a bill that would mandate that the police record all custodial interrogations. Uh, cur current law in, in New York. Uh, mandates that they record custodial interrogation, but they make exceptions for homicides, sex offenses, and drug cases. Now we're saying it doesn't make any sense to have exceptions, just like record. Right. There's yeah. a bill. There's there's a bill that would ban police from using deception and in interrogation, which you know recognizes that deception and in interrogations is inherently coercive. There's the Youth Interrogation Act, which would give 16, 17 year olds, and kids younger than that a non-waivable right to counsel. You would have to speak to a lawyer first to explain your rights to you before you could decide to then waive them. I mean, keeping in mind that most kids that age don't understand their rights. I mean, I didn't understand my rights when they were read to me, you know, and, and you know, particularly when my, whenever they would get to the portion of the Miranda warnings where it said anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. I, I didn't understand what that meant. My mind went to what I saw on television and mm -hmm. different civil court contexts. And I would think about, you know, um, I remember thinking to myself, you know, court, what are you talking about? We're not, we're not calling the court. So those two bills, and there's another bill pertaining to parole called uh, fair and timely parole, which would mandate that the parole board would have to cite one additional reason other than nature of the crime of their denying parole. And then the, the companion bill to that, the elder parole, which would is a proposition that if passed, anybody who is 50 years old and has served 15 years in prison, you know, they would be guaranteed a parole board appearance, you know, not not a guaranteed release, but an appearance. It's a consideration, you know, and that number 50 is Per the Department of Corrections, if you're 50 years old and you serve 15 years and you're considered to be elderly, just right, taking right. into account the impact mm -hmm. of incarceration on the body. Yeah, so those are the, those are the, that's the bills and legislation in, in New York. And like I said, we're trying to pass compensation in Pennsylvania. They're, they're one of 12 states that does not compensate people. Uh, in terms of some of the bills that we passed before, we did pass the recording bill, which is why they have to record in some cases. Um, there was identification reform, DNA database expansion. We passed the country's first uh, oversight. It's called Commission on Prosecutor Conduct. And then we improved discovery reform. So we're trying to do what we did in New York with the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct and export that to California. I mean, in general, when New York and California both pass the same bill, generally speaking, the rest of the country follows suit. 
so that's what we're but that's what we're about and you know i still do presentations across the country and some some international and sometimes i'm uh, so lawyers have to do what's called a complete um continued legal education to complete a certain amount of credits every year Mm -hmm. So uh, often I'm a CLE instructor, whether sometimes in front of judges or, or district attorney offices or civil lawyers. So I, I, I you know, do I engage, I engage in that. And, you know, um, I uh, as as an individual advocate, not as part of my foundation, but as an individual advocate, it'd be my, my endorsement is sometimes sought in political races by candidates that are running on wrongful conviction prevention or even just general uh, justice reform. So it's nice to be able to sit there with the candidates and, you know, run a bunch of issues by them and, you know, see where they're at and then in, inject the issues in, into into uh, political races to try to further the issues, whether or not any individual candidate happens to win their race or not. I think you still advance the issue some uh, doing that. And, you know, that's uh, quite a bit, quite a bit from yeah. somebody. It's quite and, a bit and, from somebody yeah, used to be not in prison. Only the, the role has changed. With, <laughs> The role the has role. changed and the seat has changed, right? You're not yes. sitting in the seat of the defendant anymore. <laughs> That's, That's the right. Thing. You know, uh, my organization, the Beautiful Heart Ministry, we're working on a program. It's a literacy program of how um, liter literacy and um, incarceration, it, the relationship between that, because we sure. see um, a lot of um, young, right, African-American, you know, who are involved in a criminal legal system and sentenced to these draconian sentences only because they take a plea because they are embarrassed to say that they don't know how to read, right? And just like you, they are cohorts to say that, okay, they commit a crime when they didn't or give paperwork to sign and they just assign their name. They know how to sign their name, but they don't know, but they don't want to say that they don't know how to read. So, you know, this is, this is, it's the things that's happening and I'm glad that you're able to share your story and to um to bring light um to that. Um, I qu quick question: What happened now to the prosecutor? What happened to the um the, the police officer? What happened? Were they charged for what they did to you? What happened? Short answer is nothing. To put some color to it, uh, you know they they uh, they they never faced any criminal penalties. I mean that's typical that that they don't. I did bring lawsuit, a, a successful uh, federal civil rights lawsuit, but you know that was just the municipality that they worked for. That you know they didn't pay anything and themselves personally, and they didn't face any professional um, consequences either. The most that could be said is, well, two weeks before I emerged, the prosecutor suddenly retired and went to Florida, mm. and then the, then the medical examiner, when I filed the lawsuit, he said he suddenly resigned as being the county medical examiner. So there were those two indirect things, but that was as that was as far as it uh, that was as far as it went. Right, right. They need to be held accountable for what they did. That was terrible, terrible to put a child through something like this. Terrible and shame on them. Shame on them. Now, is someone, how does someone get in contact with you or um, how do you choose your cases to um, or the folks that um, to help? How do you choose them? So in terms of reaching me, there is the website, www.deskovic, D-E-S-K-O-V-I-C.org. There is a web form there. Uh, also, I'm on social media. Um, you know, my name, Jeffrey Deskovic, on, on LinkedIn. Same thing for um, for Facebook. The foundation has a Facebook page as well. And uh, I'm also on uh, Instagram, uh, Deskovic Foundation. So you can reach me. I answer the messages. Uh, uh, in terms of how we select cases, uh, we we ask ourselves uh, two questions. You know, number one, do we believe the innocence claim? You know, is it at least plausible what someone's saying? That that involves doing an evaluation of the what was the evidence that was used uh, in order to find them guilty. And the second question we ask is, do we see a potential route to exoneration? You know, we might be convinced based on the record that somebody's innocent, but you know that that might be why we take a case. But you can't win that way. They're not going to allow the court's not going to allow you to relitigate what's already been litigated. You have to find some previously unknown evidence of innocence, or you know, in order to make a newly discovered evidence um, argument, which is what we typically do. But sometimes we uncover you know evidence that's been withheld, so we could bring what's referred to as like a Brady claim or. We could file an ineffective assistance to counsel claim for someone if that's based on counsel not presenting evidence of innocence or not doing an adequate investigation. 
But one of the best feelings in the world, though, is just going from either visiting someone or taking a collect call from them to, you know, then you seeing them on the outside, you meet up with them or they call on a regular call. I mean, that's that's really what you what you do this for. Yes, yes. Well, I salute you. I, I really do. And I appreciate you. There's more of you that's needed in this um, criminal justice landscape. There's so many innocent people that are, you know, going to prison. I just had a friend just, just came, um, came home last year after doing 29 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And we ask ourselves, how does this happen? You know, or why does it happen? But it does. Unfortunately, that is not even a question that, you know, we really can answer. We don't have the answer for it, but we know that um, it does happen. So thank you so much for, for sharing your story. Amazing, amazing. Any final thoughts, anything that you want to share, anything that can help someone that maybe listen to this and, you know, find themselves in a situation like yours? Yeah, definitely. So a couple quick things. I'll be concise. So in terms of wrongful conviction causes, we know prosecutorial misconduct, misidentification, lying informants, bad lawyering, coerced false confessions, tunnel vision. In terms of uh, tips, so uh, on the generic level, I mean, I look back to my life and ha have a goal, you know, have a realistic plan. You should be able to look at the plan in three or four ways and say to yourself, yeah, I could see how this might work. Uh, be flexible. Remember, the goal is the goal. The plan's not the goal. Uh, another thing is uh, with with that, don't be afraid of hard work. I mean, I, I think you really have to work really hard and put yourself in a position for a miracle to occur rather than just, you know, pie in the sky, drop in your lap. Uh, no excuses. You know, maybe there's reasons why something is harder for you, but no ex ex reasons why you can't do it if you're willing to work hard enough. And then never, ever give up. And once you cross the bridge, once you make it, you have to reach back and help people in, in the same position you were in. And I think that that applies for wrongful conviction. But I've seen advocates in other fields. I've seen people do that who used to be homeless, who have been sex trafficked, who have been victim of sexual assault, domestic abuse survivors, people homeless, people on the wrong uh, life path that are going to end up in the ended up in, in prison now working with at risk youth population. So I think it applies uh, across the board. And uh, I'll wrap with uh, on a practical level, if you are someone that's been wrongfully in prison, I'll give you this tip, you need to have a really short, nice and tight two paragraph uh, letter at most, just as your attention grabber. Look, my name is, I've been wrongfully convicted of, this is the sentence, the evidence against me was, mention it. Then then mention the flaw, the flaws in the evidence. Come up with your best two or three facts in the record that support your innocence. Then if you have any ideas of where to go with the case in terms of your know, investigation, you know, new evidence, uh, then finishing up. The reason I'm writing you is because I don't have any money with which to hire an attorney. I'm hoping that you consider to represent me pro bono. I have documents to support what I'm saying, but out of respect for your time, I'm not sending them right now. You know, would it be, you know, until I hear back from you. You know, that the more that people write, the less likely it's going to be read. The more you send, the more likely in the garbage. Okay, so nice and tight. No one's deciding to take anybody's case based on one letter. Okay, bye, the only bye. thing you're trying to do <laughs> as the writer, the person looking for help, the only thing you're trying to do is you, you want someone to say, well, yeah, if a Clover just told me it's true, then I could see how she might be innocent. Yeah, let, bye, let me bye. hear just a little bit. Let me hear just a little bit more about that. And you know, cases earn time as they go. And at some point, then somebody would be, you know, committed to your case. So that would be that would be a, a tip for any of the listeners out there. Awesome. Awesome. Do you only do state or you do federal as well? Yeah, we haven't. Uh, we I haven't done any federal. I mean, I theoretically could do that, but again, we're, I'm only I'm licensed in New York in, in federal courts in New York, so not licensed in in other states. So I guess if the right case came along in federal, that I, I I would consider that. But for the most part, there's plenty of work to do on on the state level. Just New York, as far as cases, but the policy work, as we mentioned a few times, that's New York, Pennsylvania, and uh, and California. Okay. Okay. Well, Drafty, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you for sharing your story. And 
just thank you for the work that you're doing, you know, and um, God had a plan for you and he's in, and, and look what you're doing now, you know, it just shows that sometimes we don't understand, right. The things that happen in our lives, but as we get older, you know, we start seeing his hands because his hands had to have maintained you while you was incarcerated. It had to. And 100%, it was definitely. a training ground, you know, for you to come home and do this and do this work. So thank you for being a servant. Really, that's what you are, a servant to others that need you, you know, and I thank you for that. Thank you for having me on. It was wonderful. Have You're a wonderful welcome. afternoon. Thank You're you. welcome. You're welcome.